Shabbat Shalom. Last Sunday evening, I checked something off of my bucket list by attending the annual Chabad Kinus Shluchim, the annual gathering of Chabad emissaries from around the world. Over 4,500 rabbis from 90 countries convening for what is considered to be the largest such annual gathering in the Jewish world. 75 years since the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson of blessed memory arrived in America from war-torn Europe, Chabad is the fastest growing religious movement of our time. From Bangkok to Kenya, from UCLA to Middlebury, Chabad houses, Chabad schools, Chabad mitzvah tanks in Midtown abound in numbers and vitality. The big announcement of the dinner was a placement of Mendel and Mussi Alperwitz to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the only full-time rabbi in the Mount Rushmore state, and an appointment that secures a full-time Chabad presence in every single state, including the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. It was a fabulous evening, my only quibble being that never have I been in the presence of so many Chabadniks, and not one asked me if I had put on tefillin that day. <laughs> and as I sat there in the company of 5,600 of my closest friends at Pier 8 in Brooklyn, I marveled at the wonder that is Chabad. Not just its meteoric growth and ubiquitous presence, or even its impassioned focus on the personhood of the Rebbe. What was most striking to me and most inspiring was Chabad's single-minded obligation to love every Jew. At the heart of its mission, a belief in Havas Yisrael, a love of the people of Israel. I encourage you to read the recently published Hertog report about Chabad on campus, a study that draws attention to Chabad's emphasis on personal relationships, on the ability of a Chabad rabbi or rabbitson to draw out the pintle yid, the divine spark that's embedded in each and every Jew. Of course, Chabad is interested in encouraging Jewish observance, but they're willing to meet you where, they are, where you are, even as they nudge you to take on mitzvot. Unlike other movements, it's not all or none. It's incremental. Every mitzvah observed is a spiritual achievement, each one a step closer to the presence of God. I learned that a Chabad rabbi doesn't see his work as outreach in Hebrew, kiruv rechokim, because as the Rebbe taught himself, we cannot label anyone as being far. Who are we to say who is close to God and who is not? Chabad's thesis, rather, is that embedded in every Jew is a nefesh elokis, a soul of the divine, untainted and untaintable, just waiting, yearning, to be given full expression, and the crux of it all, Chabad's secret sauce, if you will, is personal relationships. On a street corner, a Hamishy Friday night campus meal, or a one-on-one -on -one study session in a midtown office, the key to unlocking that divine spark is not a prescribed course of study or top-down regimen of behavior. Rather, it's a proximity of one soul to another, whereby the full potential of a searching Jew is actualized. Chabad Shlichut is mission-driven work, deserving not just of study, but of praise. But if we look merely at its numbers or institutional growth, we fail to appreciate the beauty of it all. Because what became clear to me last Sunday night is that the institution Chabad cares most about is not 770 Eastern Parkway or any campus Chabad. Rather, it's the institution of each and every unique Jewish soul yearning for expression and thirsting for vitality. The first Chabadnik, if you will, was our forefather Isaac, the hero of this week's Parsha. 
tucked away, as Zach spoke of, between Jacob and Esau's sibling rivalry, is a brief passage relaying Isaac's act of finding the stopped up wells that had been dug up in the days of his father Abraham. Isaac, the text states, dig those wells anew, gives them life and significantly calls them by the same name that his father had given them. It was the 18th century disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, the Rabbi Menachem Nachum of Chernobyl, the Maore Naim, who intuited the spiritual dimensions of Isaac's actions. Neither the founder of our people nor the father of the 12 tribes, Isaac was nonetheless the conduit of generational continuity one generation to the next. He sensed that which was laying in wait, desirous of attachment to God, the layers of earth representing all the impediments, all the obstructions to spiritual life. We imagine Isaac breaking through that crusty terrain, uncovering the flowing springs where lesser souls would have walked away. Isaac, who survived the test on Mount Moriah, insisted not only to survive, but to thrive, and what is more, to leverage his tested faith towards tapping into the wellsprings of other people's spiritual potential. And the more I thought about it, the more convinced I am that it is Chabad that represents not just the ethic of our patriarch Isaac, but also truly understands the beating heart of American Jewry. As a colleague of mine once told me, Chabad and the conservative movement are playing for the same market share. Our target audience is one and the same. Our tactics are just different. The Hertog study makes clear that Chabad's impact is greatest for those raised in reform and conservative households. On a certain level, it makes no sense. Why would a movement that overlooks the Enlightenment, promotes a non-egalitarian expression of Jewish practice, is positively parochial in its leanings, and small c conservative in its politics, holds such an appeal to a liberally minded and often disengaged American Jewry. And yet, as Hertog's study makes clear, it is precisely and counterintuitively these very elements that explain Chabad's appeal. In a frenetically paced world of online and superficial connection, where all of us stand to be alienated from each other and our own selves, Chabad provides an authenticity and intimacy that is deeply valued. I suspect the free food and drink on campus doesn't hurt, but the prospect of finding a personal connection, the belief that you matter to someone and that someone is counting on you. That's what we all seek in this world. It's why I would bet that one of my children, despite having every Jewish opportunity open to them in this synagogue, in their Jewish day school, in their summer camps, love going to the friendship circle at Chabad every week. To know that a child of special needs is depending on you to show up each week it doesn't take a social scientist to understand why it works. I am not, you're not surprised to hear, a Chabad rabbi, nor for that matter do I have any intent on becoming one. If for no other reason, the thought of asking Debbie to move to South Dakota <laughs> is a dare that I'm not willing to take. That said, we all have much to learn from their earnest efforts to open up the individual souls that dusted over springs of Jewish life. One does not need to be a Chabadnik to understand the importance of cultivating individual relationships, that community building is a retail business, one person, one Shabbat table at a time. These are insights that can find application in any community, our own included. What if, I wonder, if this building, or the new one being built, had a little bit of 770 Eastern Parkway? What if Rabbi Witkowski were able to corral an army of rabbinical students and set in motion a series of home study sessions for singles, for young couples, for empty nesters, for mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, or homebound seniors? What if Rabbi Zuckerman was able to do outreach 
to interfaith couples. So individuals exploring Judaism, considering conversion, or maybe just trying to figure out how to get a foothold in the Jewish community. What if our community was able to rethink congregational education, to include opportunities for families to learn with each other, building both Jewish literacy and community at one and the same time, one living room at a time? What if there were hours enough in a day that I could enter your offices, your homes, and your lives, and you into mine, campaigning for nothing other than the institution of your Jewish soul? It would require a dramatic rethinking of how we conducted business and allocated staff resources, an act of disinter disintermediation whereby we learn to become not just the fair way of Jewish content, but also the fresh direct. And no, I have no idea how it would be paid for. But given the stakes, given the infinite value of a soul, why wouldn't we be filled with a Messirus Nefesh, an unrelenting missionary zeal for the Jewish future? As a Rebbe taught, no Jew, and I would add, no would-be Jew, should be left behind not in Israel, not in the former Soviet Union, and certainly not in our own backyard. Because you see, for all of its successes, and there are too many to count, Chabad has limitations to which we here have the competitive advantage. We're willing to walk with you side by side throughout your Jewish journey. Hertog's study makes clear that virtually no students affected positively by Chabad choose to identify with Chabad. Why, I imagine? It is because, sensitive as Chabad may be to the soul of American Jewry, neither its theology nor its lifestyle represents the hyphenated lives that American Jews actually lead. Chabad does not embrace the non-Jewish member of our Jewish families. Chabad does not like, look to draw in Jews of patrilineal descent. Chabad does not engage with all the counterclaims, intellectual and otherwise, that modernity brings. Embracing as Chabad may be, it's not pluralistic. I share these observations not, God forbid, as criticisms, merely the limitations that provide an opening for the establishment of a non-fundamentalist Chabad, a single-minded and open-minded effort to draw out the pintle yid longing for expression Conservative rabbis love to complain when our leadership, our lay leadership, provides financial support for Chabad, when neither they nor their children have any intention or desire of living a Chabad lifestyle. What we fail to see in our kvetching is that as progressively minded movements, we ourselves have failed to provide a compelling missionary alternative worthy of our leader's investment. I would go so far as to say that the Jewish world would be strengthened by way of having parallel efforts working in concert with each other. As my Chabad friend said to me at the dinner the other night, Elliot, you and I were traveling down the same highway, but our windows are rolled up. Let's roll down the windows. Let's work together, speak to each other, learn from each other, respect each other, celebrate each other's achievements, even as we recognize our differences. There is room enough for us all, more than enough lost sparks looking to light up the dark. Most of all, let's recognize that we are all on the same team, looking to build up the individual and collective souls of American Jewry. As I reflect on my Jewish journey, and perhaps you on yours, there is inevitably a single individual perhaps a parent, a teacher, a Hillel director, or even a rabbi, who took the time to recognize the inimitable humanity of your being, who believed in you and believed that you have something unique to contribute to this world. And that person made all the difference. Each of us is who we are because we were fortunate enough to stumble upon someone willing to reach out and take the time to tap into the divine spark buried within. 
The future strength of our community, of our synagogue, lies in our willingness to do the same for others in this building and beyond. Let us dare to dream. Let us find the wherewithal to make that dream a reality. The path to a vital Jewish future is as long and as short as the distance of one soul to another. May we all have the courage to make that journey together. Shabbat Shalom.